Could you open our Bible time in a word of prayer, please? Well, as you're aware, we've been doing, I hesitate to call it a series, but, uh, but well, we started by examining the passages of the Scripture where we're all said that I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Different places where Paul talked about ignorance. So there were you know, certain uh, points that he didn't want believers to uh, be unaware of. Uh, and we moved on. Another passage that sort of captured my attention was Colossians 1 9, where he's writing to Colossae and, and he says, that For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Again, this this, this uh, construct that he, he's developing for the believer is that, that it is possible for a believer to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And of course, the reason that, that verse, uh, and we've talked about this, but by way of reminder, uh, it caught my attention is because the current theology these days is God's will is presented as something that is not knowable. It's, it's uh, something that you just have to acquiesce to, and, and uh, in essence, God's will is revealed to you through circumstances. And uh, as circumstances unfold in your life, different things happen. Uh, the view that many people have is that God is sitting up there orchestrating every circumstance around you in order to make you the person that, that you ought to be. And uh, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up under that type of theology. Um, and my thinking was corrupted in that way for many years. And of course, the that's all of that. <coughs> in every single circumstance that you find to discover yourself, uh, you're asking, oh, okay, why God? Why, why, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you, here's the other tricky, why are you allowing this? Yeah. Uh, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? Or why are you allowing this to happen to me? Uh, and what, is, what are you trying to teach me? Well, of course, in, in reading Romans chapter 8, we find out that God doesn't create character in our lives through circumstances. He, he does that through the life of his son. We find out, and, and again, again, the problem with theology is that, that our circumstances are a reflection of God's regard for us. And they're not. God's regard for us is expressed in, in, the, in the willing sacrifice of his son. And uh, so it's, uh, it's an entirely different perspective concerning the, the will of God. And what we've been doing then is beginning to look at some of the things uh, that we might, that we need to know if we want to be filled. And that word filled needs to be replete, needs to be controlled by, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a proper reference for understanding. And Paul says, be not drunk with wine, but be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, is that, is that an issue of uh, quantity? If you're filled with the Spirit, is it an issue of quantity? No. What? It's an issue of it's what's an issue of control. Yeah. You know, when we say, be not drunk with wine, well, we say, that person's full of liquor. Well, do we mean that he's full of liquor? I mean, he might want to have depending on the individual, he might want to have glass or two, you know. <laughs> it means that he's controlled by it. And so, uh, Paul says that it's possible to, to, be, to be controlled by, if you will, uh, to be affected by what you know about what God's will is. So, if Paul, if Paul had this desire, and it was his prayer for believers that they be filled with the knowledge of God's will, and he must, in his writing, reveal some of what God's will is. Right? And, and that's sort of what we've been looking at. Uh, last week, you know, we looked at the, the issue of, of like, knowing knowing the grace of God. You know, 
here in the same letter, he, he begins out. You know, we give thanks for free to God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bring it forth fruit, as it does also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in us. So, you know, we spent some time examining it. There's a lot of people that know about the grace of God, but they don't really know the grace of God in truth. Uh, that's like, a lot of people know Jesus Christ. But do they know Jesus Christ in truth? Uh, most of the major religions of the world acknowledge the existence of Jesus Christ. And they have a knowledge about it, but they don't know him in truth because there's no personal relationship with that out there and, and there's no faith. So, uh, I said or it's misplaced. Or it's misplaced, yes. Yeah. They think they know, but they are trusting the wrong information. Right. Well, <coughs> and again, and, and that has to do with, with context. Of course, if, if you're going to know anything about the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to have to come from this book. And again, the problem there there are problems reading this book if you don't know how to read this book. You think? Um, it's um. I've been trying to think of an illustration about that, and, and, and one just popped in my mind, and it, and it works perfect. Um, very often, when you get a new automobile or a new appliance, it comes with an instruction manual. Um, and if you'll notice, many times on the front of this instruction manual, it'll say it's for this model and this model and this model, and this model. And it's all in the same book. And so you're going through here, and, and, and it's happened many times. So I'm reading about a particular function, and I say, oh, yeah, okay. I, I, this, yeah, I'll, and I go, for instance, let's say on the range, and I want to actuate a certain function, and, and in my range, I don't have that function. So I was reading the instructions for a different model. Okay? If, if you think about it, so then you got to go with, and so when I read that book, I have to I have to rightly divide that book because I've got to go to the sections that pertain to my specific application. And the Bible is very much the same way. Yes, it is an instruction manual, but it's an instruction manual for for mankind through all time and history. And as we have learned through reading the scriptures, that you know, God worked differently in times past than He's working today. His character never changes. His purposes and his will never change. But the manifestation of that will is based upon um, a different content of faith and different age. Uh, different content of faith, uh, of faith, a different response is required. Uh, faith has always been the foundation of, our, of a relationship with God. But there, you know, for instance, with Israel, there were, were uh, historical and um, national uh, constructs that had to be adhered to to have a right relationship with God. It's not just about justification, it was about uh, receiving God's blessing and being a part of what God uh, was doing in that age. I mean, does God work in the affairs of men and in time? Hasn't he always? <laughs> he always has. But is that working always the same? No, it's not. So, uh, I titled this particular lesson, Knowing Paul. You know, it's interesting as we encounter people, and I don't know, I don't know if you even, do you have a strategy uh, when you talk to the uninitiated? I mean, whether a person, well, if the person's lost, I mean, the only thing you can share with him is the gospel. I mean, let's face it, that's that's basically the only Bible truth that's relevant to their um, their frame of reference. You have to address the issue of faith. Of course, they may have a particular area 
Uh, by the way, do un- unsaved people know doctrine? <laughs> yeah. In fact, a lot of times. In fact, I would say many times. In fact, I would probably say most of the time they've probably got too much doctrine for their own good. They've 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 learned something that's misapplied, generally generally from the scriptures, but from another dispensation from a different period of time, and uh, it actually prevents them from trusting the Lord Jesus Christ to protect them. So, a lot of times you have to address, address bad doctrine or wrong questions. So, in that sense, Christ's vision can be uh, a very beneficial tool in, in talking to a wrong question. Especially true when you're talking to other believers that, that don't know about the principles of, of right vision and, and preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the ministry. But it's occurred to me over the years, I found it's also important when you start to deal with someone that you that you introduce them to the to the person of Paul, the apostle. Um, if you think about the age in which we live, does not the apostle Paul serve as the example for all believers? According to his own testimony. Right. So, I mean, there, there's a, a benefit from taking an understanding uh, his history. You know, uh, in, Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul reveals quite a bit about himself through his letters. Now, I'm not saying you would, you would sit down and, and, and throw somebody up. A biography of the Apostle Paul when you're trying to talk to him. But over, I have found that as I talk to people, generally it's a process. You almost never just sit down with a person and, and for instance, go and take Timothy 2.15 and the job is done. Some people like to hand them a dispensational chart and you know, point out a few things and, and, and think that the job is done. It, it's important that people become aware of, I think, the, the historical past, if you will, of, of the dispensation of the grace of God. And that has to begin with understanding who Paul is. But in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, Paul says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he may trust in the flesh, I more. That's, that's pretty interesting. Terminology. How many people would would actually think of themselves trusting in the flesh? You know, a lot of believers are aware of the idea of the, of the conflict between the flesh and the, and the spirit. But, but uh, Paul had a, a great deal of confidence in what he was doing before he was converted. He was very very passionate. He was very religious, and, and he goes on to you know. Yeah, he circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blame. Now, I read a little bit about Paul <laughs> in the scriptures, and you know, it, it's hard for me. To think of Paul as being blameless. blameless. Uh, and of course, uh, in that perspective, that what he's saying is as far as, as far as humanly possible in the flesh, he tried to fulfill the requirements of the law. I mean, did you sin under the law? Pretty good. And there was a provision for everything. They had different sacrifices for different things, different types of, of, of uh, I don't want to use the term contrition because I don't mean to sound Catholic, but <laughs> there, there, was, there was a remedy in the law for Israel as, as, they, as they stand, both in a personal sense and, and in, the, in the national uh, context as well. I think that's where a lot of people also get confused. If they look at the scriptures, uh, they take many things 
that are written in the national context and try to make it strictly personal. Uh, they take they take certain things that are, are very specific, for instance, uh, an apostolic uh, command or or authority, and they try and claim that personally. So you know, they, they miss those those points. But Paul was was very uh, very religious. Uh, Circumcised the eighth day, he was not a proselyte. He wanted to make that clear. He was the tribe of Benjamin. Um, he wasn't. A, <coughs> he was from a true Hebrew marriage, not uh, the offspring of, of, a, uh, of a handmaid or something. Uh, and Hebrew is a Hebrew. Both of his parents, and uh, in everything, you know, the nationality, the religion, the practice, and so forth. I mean, he is a full Hebrew heritage. I mean, and very proud of that fact at that time. Uh, that that proud that pride went away later on. But uh, and he says, touching the law, he was a Pharisee. Of course, that meant he was he was of that particular sect that. But they, they felt like they most accurately adhered to the law. So they were very zealous of that. Um, and then he gets the verse. Is that relevant testimony as you're talking to, to people on the street? I mean, now if you think about that, uh, What's probably the number one objection that you get from, from unsafe people when you want to present to them the, the idea and the concept that the, through the grace of God, eternal life is a gift. All they have to do is receive it. And a lot of people just don't seem to like that message. What, what's generally the biggest op You know what the biggest obstacle is to that? No, well, that's, that's the objection from their point of view. I mean, their accusation. But the foundation of it is their their own trust and their own security and their their religious practice. They want to have a hand in doing it. Excuse me? They want to have a hand in doing it. Yes, yeah, exactly. They want to do something. Um, in other words, they don't need a gift. They have earned it. So why would they want Again, well, from a religious point of view, in the historical context in which Paul lived, there was no one that was more zealous in the Jewish tradition than he was. And yet he had to... <coughs> Actually, he came to the point, we were reading another passage, he counted his dumb. Now those are his words. Not mine. Somebody, excuse me, somebody wants them to get it. And they're now in. Um, but uh, going on, First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. Well, there's one thing that I've noticed is very, I won't say Paul showcased it, but very frequently Paul gives his testimony in the scriptures. But here in uh, chapter 1 and verse 12, 1 Timothy, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did a ignorant thing and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord, of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am he. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might go forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in that verse. You know, we, we technically, yeah. but you know, 
He said that in me first, Jesus Christ might go forth all along suffering. Now, you know, I realize I'm not the greatest language scholar uh, on the planet, but how was Paul the first in, in any sense for the Lord Jesus Christ to use him as a pattern to demonstrate his long suffering? I mean, had he not been long suffering in the Old Testament? I mean, all you, all you have to do is read Israel's history and you see nothing but a continual exercise of long-suffering on God's part. I mean, he would have wiped them off the face of the planet numerous times, would he not? So, there was something uh, unique about the Apostle Paul. But you notice how, you know, that statement, he says um, that he was a blasphemer and, and a persecutor and a jurist. Um, Paul typifies the arch enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you see, I say Paul, I should say Saul of Tarsus. Later became Paul. But uh, you know, as we come down through, you know, we look at passages like Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Stephen speaking to Israel. And he says here in, in verse 51, Ye sit next in uncertain signs and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been, now been the betrayers and murderers. By the way, as he says, sit next and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Which of the prophets have not your father persecuted? Sounds sound kind of like Paul, doesn't it? Saul, Saul of Tarsus. You know, you read down through there. And, and when they heard these things, they were touched to the heart, verse 54, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. I mean, I've heard people being angry. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their stopped their tears and ran upon him with one accord. I mean, can you picture can you picture that that scene? What is it about mobs, by the way? The mob that, that's like a mob mentality. Uh, talk about a, a riot. Does that sound like a riot? Do those are those usually do they just sort of happen or is it usually orchestrated? Well, I think I think Jeff, you, you ever you've heard the term instigator? Mm -hmm. yeah. There is almost always an instigator. There's almost always someone that has that is is, is uh, <laughs> fueling the fire, so to speak. And, and I find that the same thing is, is true right here. But they ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. His name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Did Paul take that way? Here he is, a religious Jew, as passionate as they come, looking for his Messiah. He couldn't see him in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was consenting unto his death, verse 1 of chapter 8. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered for all throughout the region. Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made habit of the church, entering into every house. 
and hailing men and women, he committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That was when Philip went down to the city of Samaria. But here's the church of Jerusalem. I mean, they not only stoned Stephen, but they drove, except for the apostles, they drove the entire fellowship, if you will, Koinonia, the association, the group of believers in Jerusalem from the city. And who was the ringleader then? Saul of Tarsus. Uh, yes. Doesn't that almost put you in mind of what they did to the Jews at the end of the Second World War? Mm-hmm. All right. They're getting fine. Well, it was worse for them in Russia than it was in Germany, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah they're always at that first piece of them. But, so, but, uh, so there, there's a historical foundation of Paul's background as, as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and his religious background. Now, I don't know about you, after I was saved, is that something you, that you would want? remember much. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I know you are. And I'm not laughing at you. I'm just thinking, oh no, I hope not. It's just not something you want to run over your no, mind mean, over and over again. No, I, I wouldn't want to be revisiting that a whole lot. I, I mean, I would think that it would be something that I would be ashamed of. And, and yet, you notice, uh, go, to, go to Acts chapter 9. Of course, you know that, that, that Paul is, is converted, and it, and it, and it, it's interesting how his reign of terror gets cut short. So in chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. I mean, this guy was on a was on a holy fair. Uh, if, if he were Muslim, I would say he was on jihad. But that he was out to completely and totally eradicate the uh, the king of church. He so he desired letters uh, from the high priest. He's going to Damascus. And then as he journeyed, verse 3, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Paul's response was, uh, All right, uh, this guy said, You're persecuting me. He said, uh, Who art thou? Lord? <laughs> yeah. You think, who art thou, Lord? Who art thou? I mean, first of all, where does it say that the, the voice came and where did the light come from? Heaven. I think he had an idea about this being a unique encounter. Uh, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to get me. And he trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said, I need to rise and go into the city and shall be told me what thou shalt do. I'll still come in it before and I'll remind you, it's interesting, if you pick up a modern Bible called Conversion, it's just totally snipped right out of that. Uh, that the, the question is there, who art thou, Lord? But the response of Lord, what would I have me to do? It's not in a modern Bible. They still have all the same verse numbers there. But what they've done is they just rearranged the verses and pulled that out. I mean, if you read the NIV or something, it, and it, it just, he says, uh, Lord, who art thou? And then it says, you're going to Damascus. You know, the, the, the response of faith is completely and totally eradicated in that. Well, this event had a great impact on the Apostle Paul. 
Now, I can see him repeating this, and, and he did, uh, you know, quite frequently. Uh, Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. There was a big to do. Uh, I, I don't know where you can start here, but verse 17 of chapter 21, they say, Come back to Jerusalem, and the brethren there received them gladly. And, uh, they went unto James, and all the elders were present. And he declared particularly what God was doing among, <coughs> among the, uh, the Gentiles. We see all the response. Uh, Paul got involved in some things there that perhaps he shouldn't have done, but uh, in verse 27, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place, and further brought Greeks into the temple and have polluted the holy place and so forth. And pretty soon, guess what? They've got another riot going on. And uh, uh, if it weren't for the fact that someone called the uh, local establishment, the Romans, and they said, sold us down, and, and they uh, took him into protected custody. And uh, Paul there in, in, in verse 39 declares to his protectors, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, the city of... Uh, let's see here, it? No. Somewhere, he let know, uh, they know that he's a, a Roman citizen and his citizenship, but then he begins to tell about his uh, identity as a Jew, and there was a great silence. And uh, Paul gets up in an elevated place and starts to give a testimony. And he says, uh, verse 3 of chapter 22, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in the city of Philistia, yet brought up in this city as a thief of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the Father, and was zealous for God, as ye are all this day. He's telling you about his religious background. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, and also the high priest of very wicked all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which are there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And then he tells about his conversion experience. But each time he comes into this type of situation, here he's before a crowd of, of, of Jews, and he's giving a testimony, and, and he's talking about the time that he formerly persecuted them. Uh, so before the Jewish people, that was his testimony. In chapter 26, and uh, verse 9, he's before King Agrippa. Um, says King Agrippa, chapter 26, verse 1, it says, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And then he goes on to, to give his testimony. Um, and he says in verse 9, and I like the like this language here, he says, I verily thought to myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> I verily thought with myself you know, that, that I could do this. Uh, which things I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them all in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even on the strange city. Uh, that was the testimony before King of Rebels. I believe First Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 
Corinthians chapter 15. Fine, if it's a simple word, Paul says, I am the leader of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Again, talking about his campaign of terror against that kingdom church at Jerusalem and, and beyond. But he considered himself to be the least of the apostles. He said, I, I don't I think he, he was totally amazed to be found in the prediction that, that God would use him. Well, that, I think that's the point. We should be amazed. And um, it's just Paul uses that you know that, that type of terminology, and I, and I think he does so for the reason there in, in Galatians one thirteen and fourteen. He says, "For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion." How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my father. Uh, a person can be exceedingly religiously zealous and yet be exceedingly ignorant and wrong. You know, when you think about it, when he gives his testimony like that, what he's truly demonstrating is really God's grace. I mean, really, that's where the demonstration is. It's God, look what God did. I was this, and I was that, and I was, he chose everything he did that was wrong, and then he demonstrates that really, in essence, by showing God's grace. Isn't that what he's saying in First Timothy chapter 4? Yeah. He's saying that God's grace is so exceeding that if He could save me through His grace, He can save anyone. anyone. Exactly. I am the pastor. In me first. In other words, if He put up with me and saved me, He can save anybody. Um, I, I think it's I think it's a beneficial thing to do to share Paul's testimony with people as you, as you begin to introduce the doctrine of Christ. Because a, a lot of times the, I, I find that resistance to grace is uh, it, it, it's built in this thing that I don't even know how to the idea of degrees of sin you know, this, 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 uh, God, this is basically something, you know, God can't say something. Uh, oh, that person is a, a murderer. You know, there are people that believe that murderers can't be taken back. That's what they believe that, uh, for instance, the day of time will have to be not set up. They think that there are certain things that, that people can do that would prevent God from saving them. But uh, regardless of the authority that Paul used as justification for his actions, I mean, he was a murderer. It doesn't really get much worse than that. Exactly. But the Catholic religion is a good example of it. They got this thing about moral sins and being of a One is a little worse than much worse than the other. And yet, when you really realize sin is sin, there it is. Sin is sin, and grace is the answer to that thing. Exactly right. And, and that. Well, that is the the core truth around at least the historical elements of Paul's testimony. And so, in in those circumstances, that's what he, he this is who I was, and this is why I am who I am now. And and he was, there was a change in direction there. Somebody got my attention. And I was the recipient of, of the great stuff. Uh, so, you know, I, there's a benefit to knowing Paul's history. It's important to know uh, Paul's commission and, and, and his authority. You know, we're not going to be able to go very far. And again, this, none of this is new material for you, but I, I remind you of it because, again, as I said, if you're dealing with someone, it's, it's going to 
be a process. And at some point in time, if a person, if they're saved and religious, these are things that they need to see and know and understand before they're going to reach to a point where they can understand. They must know the Apostle Paul. They know they must know about his apostleship. Yeah. Uh, Paul says in Galatians chapter one, verse one, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. His apostleship was not of human origin or authority. Um, of course, we spend a lot more time than we want to. Do. Not. Of course, many people think that he was a false apostle, and we know that that's not true, and we can get to say that in Scripture. But Paul had this apostleship that came from God Himself. Uh, it was the unique apostleship, Romans chapter 11 and, and verse 13. When he's speaking to Gentiles, he said, I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. His apostleship was Gentile in nature. How many saved people involved in religion that know about the Apostle Paul understand that his apostleship was different than the that of the twelve? I mean, I remember being in Bible time. Uh, when I took the book of the lady, uh, they used M.R. DeHaan. Okay. Commentary for that, and he he dedicates a, a whole chapter to the point that that uh, Paul was the twelfth apostle, that the eleven were in error when they chose the That was the doctor that got that wrong, and I think that was the church. So, but uh, it's important to understand that. Number one, his apostleship is not Jewish. And that it's Gentile in nature. Um, the other thing that I find, there seems to be, and I've encountered this, and I've encountered it on the internet all the time, that this attitude that some way that Paul's writings are inferior to, uh, to other Bible authors. Have you, have you ever encountered that attitude? It's the strangest thing. You know, several places, you know, like First Corinthians chapter seven, you know, where he says, "I speak by permission." They say, "Paul, you know, a lot of that stuff." You know, they'll say, "It's just Paul's opinion." You know, so it's, it's not really scripture. It's, it's just Paul, Paul's opinion. Well, why? Why? If, if Paul was out there writing letters just about his opinion, why, why is it that God would allow him to write the bulk of the New Testament? He either recognized his authority. Of course. And, and of course, and, and with, so we get to that in Galatians chapter two. But you know, Paul's authority. Uh, he said in, in First Corinthians chapter uh, fourteen and verse thirty-seven: If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. The other thing, I mean, if they believe Second Timothy three fifteen and seventeen, and they say all scripture is given by inspiration of God, you know, then it's not Paul that wrote it. I mean, he, he may have penned it, but he was given exactly what the Lord wanted him to write down. Uh, so what you're saying is true, Mike. Is what you're saying is a high view of scripture. You'll find that. That prevalently today, that many people don't believe that Paul's epistles are scripture. They're just that, they're letters. Now, in there where Paul, and, and I'm going to give you an example, uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting to run into people that think this way. These are the people that actually believe that the Bible contains the Word of God. <coughs> yes. Things crackling and making noises, or we still okay. Must be interference or something else. Um, that that God has a spoken revelation, 
but only where it's addressed specifically in Scripture as being God speaking. That's what they consider to be the Word of God. Everything else they consider to be basically commentary. Oh you you would be amazed at the number of people. I that, am amazed. That, well, that's how they get around. Well, not false. Well, you know, you say that's how they get around it. Quite frankly, it's, it's not. They're not trying to get around anything. Uh-uh. That's just no. the way that they see it. Right. Yeah. Now, whether they've been taught that or they evolved that on their, you know, on their on their own or whatever, that's literally the way that they that they see that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so consequently, their their view of, of the way the scripture is constructed. Is is in, and, and it's entirely different. You know, here in this particular passage, First Thessalonians chapter 4, we start beginning you know, verse 13, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that sorrow, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now, <laughs> what's he saying there when he says that? I said this. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Hey, you know, and said this. By the word of the Lord. This, this, this. Hello? This is God speaking. You know, exactly. That, that's exactly what he was doing. Uh, look at Deuteronomy uh, 13. Yeah, 13. Now, we know what the situation is. Moses received the law. Well, look at chapter 14. For if you are the children of the Lord your God, you shall not, or this, or not, thou art a holy people, verse 2, he's chosen thee, thou shalt not eat any abominable thing, verse 3, and then he goes through the beast, and so forth. But, Notice what, what Moses says in verse 18. He says, When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments, which, which God commanded you this day? 13, 18. What does he say? When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day. Now, shouldn't he have said, you know, would God command thee this day? He says, I command thee this day. And he says, this is the voice of the Lord. You know, he, he's right back. Hello, people, this is God speaking. You know, that's... You know, and he, there are people that would take fault with the Apostle Paul for using that kind of terminology, but they would have no problem with Moses doing that. And so, in, in that sense, you know, Paul has the the full authority of any <coughs> other writer. And uh, that's not that's not always going to be an issue, but you will find that sometimes in talking to people, it will be. There are people that, for some reason.